It's January 14th, 2021. This is Rook. to the West as a little kid from Iran in the late 1990s and walked the path between his Persian roots and his new Canadian home. He fell in love with making beats in his bedroom and by his teens had a viral hit getting millions of streams. Now After Hill is set to release his debut album, Tehranto. It comes out tomorrow and he's here today. And later in the program, Salman Taherpur and his Kiani concept, design and accessories that draw on a proud Iranian past. He joins us from Sweden, plus new editions of It's All Persian to Us and Hospitality. This is Conversations from to and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. there. Welcome to episode number 76 of Rook. Welcome to those of you listening around the world. Durud bar shoma. Hope you're all doing okay. Not storming the capital, literally. Uh, we are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and Telegram. So if you'd like to see some visuals with your Rook, Switch over to YouTube right now, and if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and Farsi, check us out on Telegram, etc., etc. Hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. How are you, sir? Hello, sir. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, hello, the fabulous Kion. Hello, Vijian. With avec uh, cola cap. Always. Always. Yeah, that's your brand. (laughs) Uh, With the baseball cap and groovy Shia. Hi. Ruby. Merci. Mizuni. Gule gulab. Oh. <laughs> As is, uh, uh, Ma, Shaya, how was your game yes. yesterday? Oh, thank you very much. Actually, mm-hmm. I, I wanted to send you a text yesterday, but I went to bed. And I, I mean, oh, I. Thank I, you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much. It was delicious. Oh, yeah. well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. You devoured you. it. Uh, You're yeah. a game eating machine. You know, it devoured <laughs> it. You know what that means, no, right? No, no, no. Balidi. Oh, like swallow. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. like you eat it. Yeah, you ate it really quickly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I devoured it. I, I said you devoured it. And he was devoured. looking. It was like the Simpsons. He was just like <laughs> looking, looking straight at me and his eyes were not shutting. They were just like... <laughs> Um, some uh, interesting voices in the diaspora today. Uh, coming up in a little bit, we have a, a young guy named Arya Safakish, who goes by the, the artist named Afta Hill. Afta is an Iranian-Canadian hip-hop artist. And, you know, he's really good. He's really good. And his debut album comes out tomorrow. So he is here. We'll discuss his life coming from Iran, settling with his family in Canada, falling in love with beats and rap, and getting Air Fawn, the popular Persian hip-hop star, to feature on his record, rapping in English for the first time. Yes, actually, I was going to say, I, I, I just saw Air Fawn's story that he said that I'm. Uh, it's the first time that I rapped in English, and he mentioned After Hill, and I, I sent him that. Oh, <laughs> After. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and by the way, what's the album called? Tehranto. Te- yeah. So it's a great, uh, great story. Looking forward to After Hill joining us. Then later in the show, Salman Taherpur is going to join us from Sweden. Uh, he's the founder of Kiani Concept, where he creates these. Uh, high quality jewelry and accessories all inspired by symbols of our ancient Iranian history, uh, a rich and colorful heritage, and of the late Shah as well as the Shah Banu. Kiani concept in about an hour from now. And as if that was not enough, our resident captain of cuisine, the great chef Hoss Zare, will be on the line from San Francisco with his latest edition of the Rook Hospitality. <laughs> This is your chef Hassare. And this is Rock Hassatality. It just makes me smile. It makes it, it just smiles all around. So good. 
cute. <laughs> Uh, listen, if you are interested in Rook and want to go to uh, the place where you can find out more about us, link to all of our platforms, see all of our episodes, read the Rook Reads, including the latest one just posted this week, rookmedia.com. Rook me- you know, I was thinking, Captain Reza, about that there was a time. Actually, mm. that time stretched for about four months where we made jokes about the fact that we didn't have a website. That's right. The website is really good now. It is really good. I'm Ponce glad. of the Artist has like done an amazing job. It's, yeah. it's, it's interactive. It's, there's links to everything. You can go and click on a person's name, one of the guests who's been on the show, and it goes to a full page about them and all the things they've done on the show. And uh, oh, I'm excited about it. We've come a long way. We've come a long way. Yeah. Oh, I like it. Thank you for your excitement. <laughs> Jesus. We've come a long way. <laughs> yes. What do I can get this guy a coffee or something? <laughs> Captain Reza, you're the director of the show. At it's least fake we that do you're, you're excited about it. <laughs> It's like we, we have uh, a robot in studio. It's, uh, 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 it is a website, uh, yes. Oh, this is, um, yeah, hello. hello. These two, man. All right. The best. Well, there, yeah. Rookmedia.com. Anyway, with that sell job from uh, Captain Reza, <laughs> people are like, well, if that guy's not that into it, it can't be, you know, why would I go? It looks great. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll I'll say, thank you. The fact of this key on. It looks amazing. <laughs> 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 no, really, it does. It looks yeah. fantastic. Well, it's not just that it looks good, it's that, uh, you know, you can. It's functional. Link to the, uh, functional. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. No, it is cool. It is functional. Oh, well, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, thanks. You Go just ahead. repeat it whatever. Good job. Right. Don't, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't, don't anymore. <laughs> All right. Let's get, to, let's get to work here. So After Hill coming up, Salman Tahirpur coming up, Chef Haas coming up. But first, she's a woman of letters, rook letters, that is, a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, a kook who can be erratic, but lovable, smart, and funny, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Bachaha. It's all Persian to us with Kion Nademi. <laughs> Gotta love that Baba Kata music. Nice moves, Shai. Shai has become our very own Shali Zamaradi. <laughs> Dancing in the in the control booth. I love how Haas's intro makes you feel like you're on acid, and Kian's <laughs> intro makes you feel like you're at Persian Mehmuni. It's <laughs> always time for I think a Persian we, Mehmuni. We got our right. theme switched around. So, there. what is uh, all Persian to us today, Kian Nadimi? All right, with so much negative publicity around Iranians in recent years, I've been on this quest to uncover some of the positive aspects of being Iranian. Got a girl. And more specifically, positive contributions from Iranians to the world are gifts to humanity, Gian. Yes. So it's a known fact that Iranians love to claim that everything was in fact first invented by the Persians. We do this so often. Is that the way Iranians? Sound? That's exactly <laughs> that's how Iranians. British Iranians. Yeah. <laughs> the Everything intelligent ones, okay, <laughs> with yeah. a pipe in their hand. Yes. You know, uh, we do this so often in our culture that one might even think it's genetic. Mm. So of course, not everything was first invented by the Persians. But we did come pretty close. So a very popular movie by the name of Wonder Woman came out recently. Oh. It's based on a DC comic by the same name, which tells the fictional story of a warrior princess by the name of Diana of Themyscira, who grows up on a secluded island with a race of warrior women by the name of the Amazons. So this Wonder Woman is known to possess exceptional strength, skills, superpowers, which she uses to fight off evil forces. So, you know this story, right? Well, Wonder Woman? well we know Wonder Woman. Well, I want to know where the Iranian part is. Well, yeah, yeah, we're waiting for... <laughs> so, it, I'm, I'm guessing well, Iranian... Uh, Wonder Woman is not Iranian herself. I'm getting to it. Oh, God, she might have be? We, have we run out of patience in this studio? Okay, so Wonder Woman, of course, is just a fictional story, but it's no secret that Iranian women are historically known for their impressive strength and perseverance over the course of thousands of years. So it doesn't come as a surprise that Wonder Woman, or more specifically, the legend of the Amazons, is actually based on warrior women from ancient Persia. Oh. Mm-hmm. Is that true? That's well, let me elaborate. Okay. So the real Amazon. Is that true? <laughs> she's got a segment here. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's obviously yes, it's true. <laughs> the I end. feel like she's talking Thanks to me. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> no, she's faking. Um. <laughs> so, so the real Amazons were long believed to be purely imaginary. They were known as the mythical warrior women who were the arch enemies of the ancient Greeks. Greek historian Herodotus famously wrote an exaggerated, might I add, account of their origin story. 
Of course, the epic battles between the ancient Greeks and Persians are well known, and for years, experts even identified depictions of Persian women in battle with Greek men on ancient artifacts. This was rare for that time. How did they know that they were Persian women being depicted? Well, I mean, is it hard to tell what a female the looks unibrow, like on... Uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, on, on uh, ancient artifacts, they would, so. they would show uh, female warriors dressed right, right, in Persian right, right, attire right, right. fighting off the Greeks. So that was their evidence right, of uh, right. Persian female warriors. So even by 470 AD, the Greeks began to refer to the portrayal of Persians as Amazons, turning their real-life enemies into mythological folklore. Oh. We were the Amazons. We were yeah. the Amazons. In like fact, crazy. the word Amazon itself comes from Persian language, which translates to warrior. Wow. Yeah. Is, Is it, it a far sea word? Amazon? It's Amazon. That's how we say it. Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. It's, a, it's an old uh, far, a Persian word. Oh, it's man. a very old Next word. Next thing you know, Jeff Bezos is from Abadan. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? Dig in and you might find something. <laughs> well, but besides all that, recent archaeological findings now prove without a doubt that these warrior women known as the Amazons really did once exist. Several graves of Scythian and Sarmathian warriors, people of Persian heritage, were discovered dating back to thousands of years ago. And through DNA testing, many of them were found to be female warriors. Now, these people were men and women, known for their skills in horsemanship and archery in battle. The women were trained since childhood to ride on horseback and to kill enemies with bow and arrows, skilled to be just as fast and as deadly as men. Mm. But of course, in today's world, Wonder Woman is known as an all-American feminist icon. But it's actually the Persian women who were the true feminists of ancient times. Oh, and crazy. so, as it turns out, Wonder Woman and the Amazons have Persian roots. It's all Persian to us. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I'm not sure what we're clapping for. <laughs> Wonder <laughs> Woman or the Honestly, Amazons. Honestly, I, I felt like clapping after <laughs> yes, that because this yes. was a huge surprise to me. Yeah, you know, yes. Wonder Woman is this icon in pop culture. An all-American female I I icon that was portrayed by an Israeli actress. Exactly. Right. Yeah, right. yeah so who Persian. knew? Who knew that there's actually Persian roots to this? So I, I'm quite impressed with this. The old school Wonder Woman. I'm sorry, Linda Carter, for some of us who <laughs> can remember. <laughs> it was not, it was an American. But uh, but uh, yeah, this is a very interesting discovery. And yeah. although it's really going to start feeding back into the, the the notion that everything <laughs> it is Iran, it's yeah. Persian oh. again. We but here's really the yeah. thing I mean these were tribal groups that had Persian heritage similar to the Kurdish female fighters of yes, today yes. actually very there's some parallel. Can parallels you do Aquaman now? <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out Aquaman He's from Boucher <laughs> <laughs> There was a lake in northern Iran <laughs> You know go back thousands of years and eventually everything roots back to the Persians <laughs> Thank you very much Keon uh, we We've learned, we've uh, rejoiced the roots of Wonder Woman and the Amazons. It's all Persian to us with Kia Nademi. It is time to get to our feature guest, or the first of our feature guests on this edition of Rook. Uh, you know, for those of us who have lived in this vibrant, growing, and diverse city for most of our lives, Tehranto is a cute designation we used to use to describe a little area and a couple of streets in the north part of Toronto where there were some Persian restaurants and markets. But in 2021, with hundreds of thousands of Iranians now living in southern Ontario and the greater Toronto area, the moniker is less jokey and more simply accurate. And so it only makes sense that a brand new album, a debut no less, from a rising Torontonian hip-hop star that drops tomorrow would be called... Tehranto. Take a listen to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bop. I still love my lick to my queens in the spot. Money don't see, so the sheep don't hop. Money don't see, so the sheep don't hop. Ay, ay. It's 
this motherfucker pop Assalamu alaikum to my kings in the spot Money don't sleep, so the sheep don't hop Money don't sleep, so the sheep don't hop Ay, ay, motherfucker just stop Whoa, We ain't the same I've been making beats since the fucking sixth grade Ay, legendary beat tapes Then I switch lanes like gray matter beat Ay, seven days a week Ay, hit long in the streets And haram in the sheets It's enough shotties The stick can't free There you go. Little taste of the song called Bop off the brand new album Tehranto. The artist is Afta Hill. Born Arya Safakish in Tehran in the late 1990s, he started making beats when he was 12 years old in Canada and by his mid-teens was getting literally millions of streams of his music on YouTube and Spotify as an instrumental beat artist named Safakash. But now, after Hill has moved behind the microphone and is a burgeoning hip-hop artist that's gaining the attention of both Persian and Western rap communities, tomorrow, January 15th, is the date that his debut album comes out and it is an adventurous creative compelling blend of rap soul political messaging artistry and fun and right now after hill joins me in the rook studio hello sir hello thank you for having me my well, friend it's a pleasure to have you here congrats on your new baby hey. on this album <laughs> it's more than a baby it's really a piece of my soul it, it is it's so much so that when we were just playing bop there you were actually uh singing along to your own song <laughs> Which is always beautiful to see. Like you're still into it. You're not sick of it yet. You know what's funny is that sometimes in the process, because I produce, I do a lot of the mixing. I you do, do everything. Right? I do, it's I all, do it's everything. pretty much all you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with the exception of the mastering and I'm mixing a little bit. But sometimes I also shoot the video and edit the video. So by the time the song comes out, I've literally heard it about a thousand times. Right, right. But, but you like it enough to be lip syncing in front of me here, which I appreciate. I mean, this Tehran, I feel like if Drake put Toronto, you know, the six, as it's known, uh, on the map for many folks around the world. You might be the Persian version hip hop star <laughs> yeah. to do that for Tehranto, uh, which would be really nice. You came to Canada in 1998 yes. uh, as a one year old with That's your family, right. uh, and and even at that time, uh, after just 22 years ago, there there was a much smaller Persian community in this city. Tell me what Tehranto means to you. Well, as you said, it was small. I mean, these days you, you go anywhere in the city and you can hear somebody speaking Farsi just in, in public. But I think what Teheranto means to me is this place that represents not knowing where home is. Because you can be, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, like for a lot of Persian kids, especially in the Western world, you often feel like you're not accepted with the insiders or the white kids or whatever and you're not accepted with the outsiders you're like this third thing this without a home without an identity person and that's kind of what i wanted to do with Toronto. Is i wanted to give those kids a feeling of oh no no there's you know other kids like me mm. that's kind of what it means to me it's this it's this home for people who don't have one and even in the two decades or just more than two decades you've been here you've seen that change in this city from a place where uh, somebody of Iranian descent might feel like more of an outsider to a place where, as you say, there's pretty much, I mean, it's not just now the north of the city, there's pretty much nowhere you go in Toronto where you don't, uh, it's freaky for me as someone who's <laughs> lived here for most of my life yeah. to suddenly be in a movie theater or in some bar downtown or on a street corner in a busy part of the city and hear Farsi. That's that's a it's a new feeling, but it really, as I say, I mean, Toronto was a bit of a joke. We used to, but it, it, it's actually a definition now. Yeah, uh, I used to have a joke with my girlfriend uh, of a couple of years ago where, you know, we would like to, we, we just counted every time we went out somewhere and somebody was speaking Farsi next to us. And it was pretty much every single time we went mm. anywhere for any reason. And as you said, like, yeah, it used to not be a thing. I remember when I was younger, like, we would come into the city and I still wouldn't feel like anyone would understand me if I started speaking Farsi with my brother. 
But now it's like if you're on a you bus, you gotta watch your back. You gotta watch <laughs> everything. Was that the height of your relationship, by the way, going out and counting Persians? No wonder it didn't last. <laughs> <laughs> that's your game <laughs> uh, you know you're actually from a place just north of Toronto uh, for correct. I mean people in the Toronto area will know this but for those listening around the world called Richmond Hill or as we know it in Farsi English Richmond Hill Richmond Escarborough Richmond Hill I got a story for you one time one of my family friends who just come here uh-huh. she was describing to us where she was going and she's like uh, you know I went here I went here and uh, Mar Markham, and we're, I'm like, what? <laughs> There's a place called Markham. That's correct. That, it's uh, K-H. Markham. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the Richmond Hill thing is partly where your artist name comes from, right? That's I mean, correct. you were up until not too long ago, Aria. Where does After Hill come from? Let us know. After Hill comes from a conversation with my good buddy. Um, we used to frequently do delinquent things mm-hmm. in the after hours and mm-hmm. one day we were having a conversation and delinquent he, things to yourself so you didn't you wouldn't go yes that's robbing correct. you you were you're, you're talking about like smoking joints or something yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah. um just setting the vibe setting the mood <laughs> okay. for ourselves let's call it setting the vibe yeah, yeah let's do that and um he asked me he said hey man what are you gonna do after you leave richmond hill and i just i, I told him i'm like i, I don't know what i'm gonna do after the hill and we kind of looked at each other and exchanged the strange glance, and we knew there was something there. And then, uh, lo and behold, we j- just kind of shortened it so it sounds more like a name. Just did After Hill. That's amazing, and, After Hill. And the funny thing is, I come today in this interview, and today is literally After the Hill. You're moving I just out. Moved out. You're yeah. moving out of Richmond Hill. Uh, that's a, that. That is fantastic. Let's listen, listen. On that note, let me play a little taste of the title track of your album that's germane to this conversation. This is a little bit of the new record. In fact, the name of the record is called Tehranto. This is the song Tehranto after Hill. From the zero to one to the four one six twenty three years old in the city with the kill. Back in ninety game at the city that I love in the six side caught a blessing from above and I. I left my heart in Tehranto. That's the name of the album. That's a little taste of the song Tehranto After Hill. It's interesting how Persian you are. I mean, <laughs> given that you've lived most of your, your I mean, basically your entire life, life in Canada. Uh, I understand your parents made it a rule to speak Farsi at home when you were a kid. <laughs> That's correct. The, the, it was enforced Persianness. Tell me about this. Yeah, I think that they understood the importance of carrying the culture into this new world. And they they not only forced me and my brother to speak you know, in Farsi, which which greatly helped me uh, understand the language and the culture. I think the other thing that's important is that I can communicate with my parents in the language that they understand the best. Mm. So I, I have a lot of friends here. Uh, for instance, one of my friends is Russian, but he doesn't speak Russian. Mm-hmm. And so when he mm-hmm. has to speak to his mom, there's this weird emotional barrier uh, where where he doesn't understand her emotions and vice versa. And I'm, I'm just glad that they chose to do that because now, obviously, I'm bilingual. But this was a serious rule, though, right? Yeah, you, absolutely. You, there was no English in the house. No English in the house unless it was just like me and my brother speaking and playing video games. Bad news. Bad, actually, bad news. It has to be better than mine. I grew up speaking... <laughs> You're, uh, give, give me a little Farsi. Shibaya. Shibaya. Okay, well, that sounded great. Yeah. Okay, that's some of your best work. Good stuff. Ha, you know what that is? That's like, ha, do you remember being a kid and then being like, yeah, I speak Farsi, and then someone being like, oh, say something. <laughs> and then you're like, I know, I'm really sorry. I just did that to you. <laughs> I actually am. As soon as I said it, I was like, why am I doing this to the guy? But I was just curious to hear yeah. you speak a little Farsi because I can only assume it's very good then. I mean, it's, 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 it's in your case, it's your native tongue. Not your, uh, yeah. more or yeah. less. More or less. I, uh, what it is is that I can speak with pretty good syntax and and grammar, and I think that's the most important thing. Is that I don't but, have weird inside out sentences. It, it, we're, we're, the reason I'm asking you and and talking about you being so Persian is because it strikes 
it, it, it invites qu- the questions around identity, which are very mm-hmm. interesting to me. And, and um, you're sort of this quintessential guy that um, there's every reason to believe you could be very Iranian, but there's every reason to believe you could be very non-Iranian. I mean, certainly there's second generation kids who, especially if they come here at one mm-hmm. years old, who have nothing to do with their uh, country of birth or their you know country of ancestry, and very much see themselves as as steeped in where they where they are. Your your parents it strikes me a, kind of have a paradox in that they wanted their boys to grow up really understanding and as I say being steeped in Iranianness, mm-hmm. and yet they left because you said they they were tired of the culture of Iran. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can you explain that contradiction? Um, the culture being the culture of how do you describe this? It's it's not like they hated Noruz or like you know what I mean or or the festival. They're rejecting Kremer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's <laughs> yeah <that's> the, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was more a case of a country that doesn't have um, systematic rules in place or, or or a consistency on how it enforces its rules to its people, mm-hmm. and and it's very frustrating if you're somebody who makes an honest living or if you're somebody who is just a person whose hands are not in others' pockets all the time to be in a system where it does not reward you for an honest day's work. You know, you you end up some some people make fun of you and shit. You know, like look at you. You go to work every day. You don't make shit. You know what I'm saying? So that has to be a frustrating feeling, especially knowing that. Um, I mean, in hindsight, they came here and they were extremely successful because there are rules in place. And I'm not saying Canada is a perfectly fair and just society, mm. but compared to Iran, it's like it's really day and night. But it's interesting that they would. Uh, and this is not unique to you. I mean, we all have yeah. this kind of paradox, and, and this is the part of the subtext of this whole program and this whole cultural mission we're on is kind of like tr- trying to figure out how we're navigating our identity. And uh, when we come from a place that our parents wanted to leave, but also want us to feel connected to. Yeah, yeah. And do you find that that messed with you as a kid? Like, do you find that you found moments where you're like, where the fuck do I belong? Where am I supposed to be? A hundred percent. I mean, much worse so than you. I, yeah. I, I, I went through years of being in an ethnic closet because for me it was not the 2000s like it was for you. <laughs> for me it was the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And I was, and I really thought, you know, uh, I can't even tell people where I'm from because no one will relate. No one will like me. No one will, you know, I got, get called a terrorist or be made fun of or whatever. So um, it was very difficult. And then and then the realization in my late teens and into my early 20s that, wait a minute, I, I love Iranian culture. I love Iranian people. I love my family. Why am I hiding from this? This isn't because of what I've experienced in terms of the culture itself. It's because of what others want to project onto us, right? Yeah, and I find that um, once you accept your culture as an Iranian, especially as a diaspora Iranian, you start to realize that it's a humongous advantage in terms of I am much more interesting than than John Hmm. or or Brent because they don't have this 2,500 year history behind them. Beautiful, nice, yeah. But with that said, how how easy was it for your family to adjust to coming here? I mean, your your dad was a doctor in Iran. Your mom was a dietitian in Iran. They come here. I'm assuming they couldn't just slide into those no. careers when they got here. Um, what was how clunky was the the landing? I mean, as clunky as a immigrant story can get when you don't have a robust uh, system. I mean, Iranians come today. And, you know, you can go to the supermarket and speak Farsi. You can go to the bank and speak Farsi. It's it's not necessarily hard. But back when they came, it was like, all right, we're in a totally new ball game. So my mom had to uh, work full time. My dad had to work full time in a factory. So my mom would work during the day. My dad would work during the night. And both. And your dad had been a doctor and now he comes and works in a factory. Yes, a computer... Uh, database. It, uh, I think it's called Celestica. Not to take anything away from factory workers, no, no, no. but it's a it's, uh, it's a it's dramatic shift, big though, shift yeah. for sure. Um, from being from having a quote unquote prestigious job to coming and literally working with your hands all day on 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 computers. And um, how did that affect you? That change that your parents had to go through. Well, it didn't. Well, I opened my eyes here, right? So it's, it's kind of different. But for me, what it was is that. 
I always saw them working as hard as possible. So in my head, I knew that I had to self-regulate. When we, when, when uh, my dad comes home and he's exhausted from working eight hours and he doesn't get any sleep because he has to watch me, I know that I'm not gonna go and you know start a fire in the kitchen because I see it. I mm. see how hard he worked. Mm. I see the blood and the sweat and the tears that he's put in just to make me and my brother happy. So I'm not gonna go around and flip tables. It should just be a shit disturber. So I really ha- it, it forced me to grow up right away. Did there you was- see yourself growing up? As an immigrant, do you see yourself as an immigrant? I see myself as a, this is some hippie shit, I'm sorry. I see myself as a child of the world, truly. Um, I don't I don't ascribe myself to a place. Where I truly see myself as a citizen of the world. I, I love Canada with all my heart, but that feeling of, of, of being without a home is a strong one. And, and, yeah, and, but ha- hang on a second. Mm-hmm. Your your album is not called Citizen of the World. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you put out a record called Toronto, correct? Which is exactly speaking to your identity, your background. Well, let me so, let me posit this. So, we move here in 1998, and then we move again in I think 2003 to Kingston, Ontario, uh, as my dad is getting his residency to become a doctor again. Okay. And then it's a we smaller m- town in Ontario. It's yeah. a city, but a, a smaller one for those listening who don't, don't know it. Yeah. it. It actually has all the major jails, which is uh, where my mom worked as a dietitian in the jails. Okay. And then we moved to London, Ontario again, like three or four years later. And then we move again to Richmond Hill okay. when I'm starting ninth grade. So I was never in one place right. for longer than a couple of years. You were on a tour of Ontario, yeah. as it turns out. Yeah. And, and in between all of this, every two, three summers, I'm going to a run. To visit my family so i truly was always sort of on the move and had to get used to the idea that home is wherever you make it but when you um okay the citizen of the world i get that i <laughs> I, I uh i've used that kind of uh um we are global people mm-hmm. uh, um but uh, I, I, I used to call myself a nowhereian because I, could, I mean, I, I really, <laughs> I'm not really from good way of anywhere it. in particular. It mm-hmm. doesn't. How can I possibly, you know, a, a kid who grew up in a Persian family, born in London, moves to Canada, lives in a Jewish community? I mean, where, you know, uh, what, what's my, uh, but can can recite the Lord's Prayer because I learned it when, in, <laughs> growing up in England. We used yeah. to do it at the, at the beginning of school every day. Um, but if you see a new arrival from somewhere be it Iran or from India or uh, from Europe or somewhere in Africa, uh, I'll bet you relate to them on some level. Certainly. So you, you are a citizen of the world, but you you, you understand immigrant. the immigrant experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, what is being a citizen of the world but being an immigrant, mm. right? I mean, you have to consider that there is um, later in human evolution i'm not using evolution biologically but rather sociologically Mm -hmm. Uh, humans begin to uh, cultivate agricultural abilities and really like sit down and stay in one place but for most of human history we've been moving around Mm. that is the natural way of things is moving around being nomadic right and it's weird because in a technocratic kind of society that we live in in the modernized first world you can sort of see this again people are uh, more inclined to, oh, I want to go live here for a little bit and I want to go live here for a little bit. And, mm. and it's returning to that beautiful state, but in a totally different context. And so when I say citizen of the world, it really does mean that like, you know, being uh, home is where you make it. As you said, you, you're a nowhereian. The story is you, you, as a kid, you're quiet, but you're popular. You're an athletic kid growing up. You're great at sports. And then around the age of 12, I mean, tell me if I'm getting any of this wrong, you start making beats, and yeah. and do you remember when you were first intoxicated with the idea of putting drum beats and samples <laughs> together? My brother got a laptop, so he was going off to university, and uh, it came with GarageBand, and so I'm like, yo, let me play on your laptop and shit, right? So he was like messing around with GarageBand a little bit, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's pretty cool, and then I did it, and I just sat down, and it felt natural, like, I just sat down in front of her for two hours and then I, I showed my brother and he's like, yo, what? Like, h- how did you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. It just sort of happened. And from there, I, I, as he left, I had to figure it out myself. So I went on my computer and I 
uh, legally in air quotes, <laughs> downloaded software and taught myself how to do it and just spent as much time between that and making uh, films. So you're this kid who, and where are you at this point? Which London, London Kingston? London, Ontario. Okay, you're, you're, wow, you're a kid and you're an Iranian kid <laughs> in London, Ontario. In a white suburb. In a white suburb of London, Ontario uh, on GarageBand, uh, on your computer, basically creating songs, creating tracks uh, based I mean, on that's beats. An overstatement they weren't songs or tracks they were just well well, well, well where does safakash comes from so then uh, so i make music in london ontario for three four years nothing too serious um it starts getting picking up when i download the software called by the FL way Studio. in your official bio it says he started professionally making music at 12. <laughs> we gotta get so, that changed. so if this was an overstatement you, you gotta talk my, to your publicist listen 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 Whoa. i sold my first cd to my dad when i was 13. <laughs> okay all right all right that i think that might qualify <laughs> um so i make these beats for a couple years in london ontario and then we moved to richmond hill first day of school in grade nine and from there, I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I like this uh, name that I was going under before. It's not really important, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take my last name and just make it a little more English, English-y yes. or yes. whatever. And so I changed it to Safakash, not really for any reason other than I was just like, just let me change it. And I was putting beats up on, on SoundCloud at the time just for my friends, like not to do anything in particular but you know we can get into it but it, it, it sort of took off from there yeah i mean you might have been uploading them for some friends but they end up safakash ends up getting hundreds of thousands and then millions <laughs> yeah. of streams right let me let me play a little bit of a, a, a tune called deep inside this is one of your early ones right mm -hmm. or you're about 16 years old? Or? At this point, I must have been 17. 17. This is uh, After Hill in his previous incarnation as Safakash, way back when he was 17, six years ago. Take a listen to this. It's great. I mean, I get, I get the appeal of it. So, so you're 17 years old. You make that. You upload that. Mm -hmm. You and start to make money from these streams, right? So I send these beats that I had, um, ones that weren't even uploaded, to a very famous YouTuber, Casey Neistat. And at the time, he just had his email in his like in his website. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna send it. I send it, and I send a video of me making the beat too because I was making films and he's like, yo, I love it. He uses it and uses like three, four, maybe five other ones. And I'm like freaking out because, you know, I go to school one day and the previous day I had 50 plays a day. Now I have 10,000. <laughs> so I'm freaking out. My buddy's sitting in first period. We're both freaking out. And I go home. I talk to my dad. I'm like, dad, what do I do? He's like, yo, you should. Uh, Did he say yo? <laughs> 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 that, is that where you got it from? The way your, your street language. So your dad says, "Yo, yeah." My, my dad goes, "You should uh, as, Azizam, as, yo, yeah. yo, Azizam, you yeah. should put your music and uh, yeah, he's like, you should put it on uh, Spotify, iTunes, whatever." Wow. And it was like, it was like thirty bucks. He's like, "I'll pay for it. It's okay." Right. I'm like, "Thanks, dad. That's pretty cool of you." So, I I put it up on the streaming services just to get it to more people it was really just like a platform for more people to listen mm -hmm. um, a couple months passed by and a couple more uh, YouTube placements with Casey and I'm looking at the numbers on Spotify and it's like I don't know 80,000 100,000 per song on this like album that I just threw up because <laughs> right, I, sh I right. needed to right. essentially and um, it, it was just crazy because I didn't spend a single cent advertising. I didn't, I didn't have a manager. I didn't know what I was doing at all. But here I am now making a, like almost $1,000 a month at this point as a 17-year-old kid with no overhead costs, with nothing. Right, right, and um, right. It, it was, it was mind-blowing. 
Well, there's the thirty dollars that your dad spent. To yeah, that's true. Get I, you on those platforms. I paid him back. Don't worry. <laughs> and then, um, so it, how, how did that yeah. affect you? Is it is that where you started to think? Wait a second. This this can actually be a career. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, it's it's insane because you know, being seventeen, right? A lot of my friends started working at stores or whatever, and here I am, messing around on my laptop, making two or three times as much as they do, for just like sleeping, <laughs> and and I'm thinking to myself like this is crazy like this. I, at I was, some point, at some point, you're making about five thousand bucks a month, right? Yeah, I think by the time I was eighteen, I was making five, four to six thousand dollars a month just. Just from streams, streams of these songs alone. that didn't take you that long to write and throw no. up on the internet. And Each one would take me two, three hours to make. And um, what I would do is um, my dad got me a vinyl player that connected to my computer. So I would go downtown and get two crates of $1 vinyls mm-hmm. and then just go through every single vinyl until I found samples that I liked. And I would flip them and then I would just throw them up. The only problem with that being... <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's some but legal. It's, it's not legal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that caught up to you. It certainly did. And in the meantime, though, it was great because not only did I get the streams, but I had companies approaching me. Hey, we're doing a commercial for Mercedes Benz. Do you want to do the song? Or uh, Mountain Dew or these guys from Google were starting a show. Um, th- there was just all these opportunities right. around me. So on top of that money I'm making from streams, I'm making doing little contract jobs here and there and then taking the songs from the contracts and then putting them up on soundcloud too i feel like it's almost um would you say it's almost a blessing that that did happen though because it 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 does kind of explode implode it it explodes and then it implodes uh in that um the legal stuff catches up to you and Mm -hmm. um you had said at one point that your 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 life kind of deteriorates you you there's a girl that you're into you Mm -hmm. end up blowing all this money on on this relationship and you're deteriorating into a guy who's smoking weed and has anxiety um is it almost a blessing that you went through that to as a training ground for where you're headed now um yeah i mean it's quintessential to the story to get here sitting you know in front of you today honestly right like it was a blessing because despite the fact that I was making money and being successful, uh, once everything imploded, I'm like, oh, I don't know anything. I don't have management. I don't have a company. I don't know how to clear things. I don't know. I literally don't know anything. And it Were you of, freaked out when the, you found out that this was... I mean, did you know what you were doing was illegal? I knew once I started making a lot of money because uh-huh. then I started looking into it. Because <laughs> at, at start, my mentality was if nobody's listening right. to it, then it doesn't matter. Right. Which is also not true, by the way, for <laughs> young musicians. Clear all your samples if you can. But I didn't... I was like... I don't even have management. I don't know who to ask about sample clearance. Right. And I'm like, you know Did what? you ever get really scared that you're going to be yeah. hauled away into jail or something? It's or? not even jail, but what they do to you is basically they email you and say, hey, you didn't clear this sample. So uh, you're going to send us all your financial statements. Mm-hmm. And so I freaked out. I'm sending these financial statements and I'm like really freaked out. And um, then they look at it and what is supposed to happen is that then they're going to say, okay, give us 80% of the song going forward and things would have been fine. But I freaked out and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to delete it. And then they're going to leave me alone. And they actually did. But the consequence of that was that now I didn't have my major source of income, which was that first album called Lean Back. Not to mention your your repertoire, which is something to be really proud of, is of gone for now. I, I yeah. still get people to this day who are like, hey, man, can you put that Lean Back album back on Spotify or whatever? To this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You move on from this period into being becoming what I'm, uh, I would loosely say, a more traditional hip hop artist. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're passionate about hip hop. Yes. Why? So I've obviously always loved hip hop and uh, had a deep love for it. But going to university, uh, like every other university kid, I was trying to take the easiest course possible. (laughs) And one of my buddies says, yo, let's take this course. It's literally about hip hop. Your brother, your buddy sp- speaks the same way your father does, by the way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the people around you. <laughs> In my head, yeah. you sound like that too. <laughs> yo. <laughs> Can I do an impression of you yeah, on please, the phone? Yeah. Right? <clears throat> hey, buddy, what's up? 
Hey, hey, buddy, how you doing? <laughs> that sounds nothing like. <laughs> first of all, I'm insulted that you didn't have me saying yo first. <laughs> Second of all, I don't know what that impression was, <laughs> but I uh, I appreciate the care you put into it. Yes, so you're so you're going to you're going to school. You're looking for the easiest, easiest way to get a degree. Mm -hmm. You're at York, right? That's correct, uh -huh. York University. And my buddy says, "Here's this hip hop course." We walk in, very first day. This man with dreadlocks is walking down the stairs, bumping reggae on a BlackBerry next to his ear, and I'm like, "This class is going to be the greatest class of my life." Sits there, goes, "Hi, my name is Ron Nelson. Do not call me professor." Oh, wow. And I was like, huh. And then he told me that, or the class, that he had the first hip hop show yeah. in all of Canada. Oh, Ron Nelson, yeah. Yeah. He's the guy. He's the he's one of the, the pioneers of hip hop discourse mm -hmm. in Canada. Yeah. He's a true um, carrier of the culture, if you will. You so know? you learn from him. Yeah. He, he taught this course about hip hop from the very start. And for those who, of you who don't know, it goes really deep. Um, hip hop. A lot of people don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you can do this in a in a, a synopsis, so, I mean, why should be like you, you know, friendly Iranian person who's <laughs> listening right now in Lethbridge, Alberta, care and respect uh, the the art form of hip hop? Mm -hmm. So I'll just give you like a quick rundown. If I might be a little mistaken, but um, in the late. 50s and 60s there's a man named Robert Friedman who is a city planner and he designs um, public housing in Brooklyn and in the Bronx and not only that he creates a above ground rail system uh, which is still there today which is very loud and very like disruptive so all the families who had money to leave that area leave that area and the only people who are left behind are the people of color that the american system doesn't give a fuck about to this day and meanwhile there's this dj named dj cool herc who comes in from jamaica with all of his reggae albums and he throws these beautiful block parties for the people just to like have fun and release honestly he takes two turntables and has the same record twice and then he learns how to loop it by just literally playing the record on one side and then switching it to the other side and playing it and then <laughs> quickly rewinding the first one and just doing that and so he learns how to take the section of the song with no words where it's just the beat break the and replay it a whole bunch of times meanwhile there would be someone on the mic who would you know uh, what was it called? There's a word for it, but it's like emceeing. He wouldn't be like, party people, put your hands up. Party na -na. And that was based on a couple of things. That was based on like the ramblings of people like Muhammad Ali, who used to go into these beautiful Basically rhythmic. Basically would do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or James Monologues, Brown. yeah, yeah. Anyways, that grows and that grows. And one of the major things that actually uh, led to hip hop's rise is a giant blackout in New York. And as there's a blackout, people Summer start, of Sam, it's 1977, yeah. yeah, yeah. Pe people kind of start um, taking matters into their own hands, so to speak, and mm. taking turntables, mm. lifting turntables for themselves, if you will. And that widespread distribution of, uh, I use the word distribution here very loosely, <laughs> oh, yes. of equipment yes. leads to the rise of hip hop, and more and more people are going to these parties, and... That's sort of how it it's starts. literally music coming from the street from literally yeah. nothing from and the now street. And, but uh, and so that's a I mean thank you first of all it's amazing <laughs> that not just that you recounted that but that you care so much about it but that's the question why do you care so right. much? I mean that's a great story but that's why does the, the Iranian background. kid from Tehran who came okay. to Richmond Hill uh, via Escarborough, <laughs> Kingston, and London, uh, connect with that. Great. So these people were severely disenfranchised, okay? And uh, coming from a country where there is severe disenfranchisement mm. of the working class, y you need to, and by you, I mean those people, uh, kind of have this strange parallel to hip-hop and it goes even further than that what year does hip-hop start 1979 what else happens in 1979 the mm -hmm. iranian revolution mm -hmm. so it, it really they have this weird parallel that i've not been able to get out of my head ever since i started putting the connections together that's really interesting and who fucked both of those people over the united states low-key the only thing you haven't said is that Iranians invented hip hop sometime, <laughs> so, so, somewhere in Mashhad in the '60s. But I, but I appreciate that you've left that off the table. 
Uh, it is it is amazing that you are taking that disenfranchised, that story of oppression of the Iranian people and uh, seeing the parallel in the rise of hip hop and then using it in your own music. And, and I have to say that to bring this back to your record, which comes out tomorrow. And again, congratulations. Thank it's you. your debut album. Yes. I think it's stellar. I think it's conceptual. I, I think, as I said in the beginning, it's very creative. But it, it's also quite political. Mm-hmm. I, I'm actually not sure how I feel about the politics of it in terms mm-hmm. of in terms of how in your face you've decided to be. Uh, I know that that was a really conscious decision for you. Yeah. Tell tell me about that. So you can recall I, I called you back in the summertime of last year. That's 2020, and I was like, hey, you know what? I'm thinking of making this political record and where it stemmed was learning more and more about the um revolution you know growing up you always hear your parents say like this that this that this that yeah. and you're Before like the okay, revolution, this okay, and that. Yeah, yeah. okay okay but then the more you learn about it the more interesting it gets and truly it's one of those things where the more you peel it back the more you're like whoa this thing goes so much deeper it the, affects everything. 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 Yeah. The whole yeah. Middle yeah. East was turned yeah. inside out. Yeah. Every, every once in a while, uh, not every once in a while, regularly, actually, some people might write to us on, on Rook and say, do you guys have to talk so much about the revolution and stuff? And, and we realize that to go deep into any subject that has to do with Iranians and our culture and our background, you can't leave that you off the cannot. table. Because it infects and affects everything. And the weird thing is the more you learn about the revolution, the more you realize that the chain of events that started it truly start in the 1900s when there is a coup d'etat from the uh, British who come in and replace the, the is it the Qajar king at the time? I think. I'm, I'm not there's like a, lot of, a historian. There's a, there's, but regardless. There's my, disagreement on where the chain of events yeah, began. But go ahead. Yeah, my yeah. point is it, there's this whole slew of events of other countries getting involved in Iran. And the moment that in 1950s, right, the people uh, elect a democratic uh, representative mm-hmm. th- and, and it seems like oh you know Iran's got this oil the infrastructure's coming up people are getting more educated as soon as things look like they're about to turn there's foreign intervention again mm-hmm. and that's when the Shah is is, is instilled Return as a to power, yeah. puppet right mm-hmm. it's just crazy that America w- loves to shove their fist in any country that starts to control their own means of production and their own resources mm. and it's happened time and time and time certainly again. through the 20th century yeah. right and so i i don't even remember what the question is so i'm just uh, heated. The, 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 <laughs> the question was please give us a background on u.s imperialism no that wasn't the question <laughs> that's where you decided to go the question was um why you decided to make the conscious right. decision to to put out a, a record that so, is distinctly in some of the tracks political wonderful thank you so it goes back to what I said. There's two important events in my life that I was not alive for, and they both happened in 1979. My favorite art form was born, and my country was put on a trajectory that will forever change it. So uh-huh. I thought that it would be important to pay homage or homage, or however you pronounce that word, mm-hmm. to these events because they shaped me as a human being beyond my but your reality is i mean just for me to push back i don't necessarily Mm. disagree with that i think it's actually beautiful that you uh, you have the passion that you want to speak out about iran and being iranian and do that from toronto uh and tehran so but you know to push back i mean if you wanted to be political you could rap about justin trudeau or donald trump or poverty in toronto Mm -hmm. you're rapping about khamenei that's correct why because there is no westernized artist who has spoken about this, who is also Iranian and and, and has grown up uh, adjacent to these events. And there's a lot of us, as you said, you know, there's about 100 to 200,000 Iranians in the GTA alone. OK, mm-hmm. once you factor in New York, once you factor in London, once you factor in L.A., how many Millions. kids there's, is there yeah. literally like us who don't have a voice who don't even understand or maybe for for myself at least i didn't even uh consume uh media in farsi when i was growing up you know what i mean so there was nobody speaking about the things that uh unbeknownst to me were affecting my life so drastically Mm -hmm. maybe not in the moment but you know in hindsight 
I want to give it. I want to play a little taste of a track uh, off this new album called Mullahs. Now, this is a powerful song. This is one that makes no bones about its politics. Where did this one specifically spawn from? I made this beat in ten minutes, and then I wrote the song in about fifteen minutes. And what happened is I spent a lot of time researching the revolution and the hit past of uh, like the Iranian past. And the more I read, the more just angry I would get. Mm-hmm. And so I just needed to like release all of that anger in mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. burst of 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 uh, vocal experimentation. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I I mean I do get it. I did my version of that. Uh, my independent thesis in the 1990s at York was on revolutionary Iran, wow. partly on that quest to understand. I mean, I wasn't there. That's I was too young thing. for it, all of that, but to understand what our background and is. And that's the thing, right? You need to understand. It's like once you start reading about this thing, you're just like, wait, but then what? And, mm-hmm. and who did this? And and there's just always more and more and more and more and more questions because there isn't reliable data on what truly took place. But you want to take a position. Correct. Yeah, and your position is quite aggressive here. Well, I mean, it's extremely it's about as, aggressive. Yeah, it's about as aggressive as you could possibly Hell get. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah, let me let me play a little bit of uh, Mullahs. This is After Hill, his brand new album coming out tomorrow. This is uh, a song on that record. Take a listen. To set the people free. I'm a outsider to the insiders. Uh, outlaw to the outsiders. Uh. I'm coming amongst some common men I don't get any press, ain't no focus in them Still I spit a dump, like nasty and Eminem They wanna use my image as a person resurrect But fuck, Rohani Khamenei in the system It's a violent pack of heads, but hating people like him But the real cock heads talk a dollar and shit shit You fucked your people over, you dirty pieces of shit Foul pathetic bullies all tired, headed pussy Prophetic visions of triumph, mullers in front of juries Crimes against humanity, all tyrants fall eventually But who I'm out of top, but the hippie gone up his medicine yeah. Outside to the insiders uh. You guys should have played that third verse. Oh, we're going to get to, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. keep shy playing that right now because we'll come to the third verse because our friend, uh, uh, our, the hip hop star and yeah. Persian hip hop pioneer, Airfon, is on this track. And he's rapping for the first time in English. Is that right? That This is his debut English verse. I can only imagine that it was an honor for you to have uh, and I can also only imagine that you had to clear the politics of this with Airphone. Like, oh say, no, man, he was on board. He, he heard was right the on song, it. and he's like, "Yo, <laughs> what did you do?" He speaks just like your father. He actually does speak <laughs> like that. He's an LA bro. <laughs> I, I'll do my Airphone. Hey, hey, brother Ario, yo, this is crazy, man. You. D- <laughs> That's actually pretty good. That's a good Airphone. That is good, right? Let's turn it back up here and come to his verse. <laughs> Stop out of starving artists Freedom to target They let it talk about how we so awful Western ass culture The fucking devil is silky powder People are starving And all your money is going foreign You morons oxy Your oil is steady Your war is proxy Fuck coming in Cause I'm on money Go ahead rock it Condemning cappers for murder For George Floyd But six months prior You shot your own boys up Fifteen hundred people murdered Because they boys up One love leaders Are scared of us when we join them See legend had it that atop the mountain sat an enlightened being, one who could help me with my quest. A kind young lady helped me traverse the mountain top, climbing higher and higher until I yeah, found yeah, her. Yeah, 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 yeah. I come seeking the truth. I gotta free the Persian people. Tell me how did I do? Yeah, uh. Tell me how did I do? This shit took time, homie. Wasn't out of the blue. Yeah. Uh, this is the life that chose me Now I sit back and watch Like a spot on the nosebleed Sit back and watch Watch me and my boys lead Overdose and poison The noise on these cold streets Just my immigrant story, bro Immigrant left long ago I'm still living it The feeling is so strong As though I'm still living in Iran And I'm stuck asking what this prison is Caged in my thoughts Like the joke of funny, isn't it? I'm limitless I won't let the little shit belittle this 20 years and it's still repping it hard There's a certain path to walk When you step in with gods Now they label me the sun And I'm left with the stars Went to war with my heart And I'm blessed with the scars Fuck anyone who tries to block your shine Mm. He killed it. He, ki- he, he, 
I can't even believe that's the first time. Yeah. He, it's so natural. He's so good that I just assumed that I've heard well, I mean, Airfon in English before. He, he told you, man, like he's he's been listening to Tupac and Biggie and all yeah. those guys his whole life. So I love the guy. Yeah. Wow. So I, I mean, your decision, you know, back to that phone call and you were kind of weighing how political you not that you, you want to be real to yourself is mm -hmm. what I, t I take this track to be it's like this is you you you're being honest um but you know there's implications i mean mm -hmm. I, there's not there's no vacations in iran for you now for the next <laughs> few, few years i could imagine right well listen it's a decision you need to make do you want to i say this in, somewhere else in the album i say i would rather speak truth than make money and stick to it mm. w what's important here what are we doing here? This is a conversation I had with my friend. There's really only two types of art. There's informative art, and then there's art that makes you, uh, not distractive, but you know, takes you out of where you are and mm. puts you somewhere else. Sometimes those two things can, can coincide. Be, be both there, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I feel like right now, uh, especially with hip hop being such a monetized art, um, you're getting a whole bunch of distraction. Mm. You know, we're, we're getting a whole bunch of substanceless bullshit. And why is it people people in music especially hip-hop used to be the carriers of truth you know even going back to the five percenters in new york you know they their whole thing was truth one of the core elements of hip-hop there's five elements one of them is knowledge and we're losing that why are we losing that because but we don't but, care. Um, but there are hip-hop artists uh, i don't want to certainly throw him under the bus but our, our you know fellow Torontonian Drake mm -hmm. he's not always political I can't even really put one political but he, Drake statement but you, to mind you think he's a good he's a decent hip hop artist don't Yo, you okay here's my question so can, can this you is, this you, is important you don't, uh, go, yeah go ahead you can be you can make distractive or unimmersive art and be a good artist mm -hmm. there is no uh, I'm not making a value judgment oh, I see okay but what i am saying is that it is still up to us as the people to carry the tradition of speaking truth mm. that is still important. can you be an iranian artist without being political no interesting not not a western artist so paris tanavali can't create a sculpture that doesn't have to be a commentary on the current <sighs> okay if we're talking just i guess art in general that's <laughs> no i'm it. asking uh, yeah, yeah well you, you can but again it's a it's an event that sort of shaped you whether right. you like it or not it shaped you it shaped me it shaped anyone yeah. who was born there uh, or, a, or adjacent it just did it's, it's an, a it's question a we all struggle with yeah. and and uh uh so uh, there is another part of this though where that where I, I see a duality in you. If you'll forgive me for saying this, I mean, if you if you don't no, it's true. if you don't agree with this, it's tell me because you're clearly a serious person. Some of the tracks on on this record are profound, political, as we've discussed. Then you have these videos out online that are <laughs> that seem to be about partying yep. and girls and and the stereotypes of what we would think of as a hip hop star aspiring to. How do we? How do you navigate that after hill duality? Okay, this album was meant to function as putting your medicine in the ice cream. That's how I see it. You wanna give people the truth. If you just tell people something, they're like, shut up, quit preaching. But if you give them the ice cream and then you hide the truth in it, <laughs> then they're much more inclined to take it. Mm -hmm. And and maybe my, my thing is a lot of people are gonna hear this record for the first time and be like, yo, that just sounded great. Like that production was intense. Right, the vocal right. performances were intense. Were great. Doesn't matter what the lyrical yeah. messaging necessarily is. But then the it. fifth or sixth time, you might be like, "Oh, you know what? Let me search up the lyrics. Let mm. me see what he's talking about." And then you go, "Whoa! There's this whole other world in the lyrics that exists. There's a whole story going on. It's multifaceted. There's there's all these profound statements. I mean, I'm not gonna right. say they're profound, right? I, mm. I said them, but you know, there's it goes deep." It's it's an onion. It's it's multi layered, and and the point was, this duality you speak of was intentional. I chose to. So the video that's like yes. Persian girls, uh, yep. the one that's called Persian girls, is you you sort of frolicking, and that that's intentional. Yeah. Well, Persian girls is a celebration. It, it okay. Uh, it's not really you frolicking. Maybe I. I you know, but you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. I, I think here's here's the thing. My goal here as a hip hop artist is a couple things. Mm. I don't want to be a cheesy like, "Hey man, you should the truth is this in the right?" But you also <laughs> don't want to be the guy who's like, "You know, I'm getting money and bitches and business and nah, nah, right? So there's this point in the middle that's great. Uh. And furthermore, what I want to do is give these Persian kids some swag. 
we are cool as fuck, but we don't carry ourselves like we're cool as fuck. That's the issue. And so when I make a song called Persian Girls, it's because I want these Persian girls to realize y'all are absolutely beautiful, but you might not carry yourself the way uh, girls of uh, uh, white girls carry themselves and, mm. and they think they're the shit and they think they're this, that, and the other. It's like, I want to give them you the swag. Empower. Yeah, you I want to give these, these, these Persian girls kids a reason to be like i am so fucking cool because i'm persian because i'm this Mm. because i'm that that's what is it what does it mean to uh this is a you answer this however you want (laughs) i ask this question and it always elicits kind of an interesting response what does it mean to to be iranian for you uh it's a weird question because i mean your citizenship is canadian i assume that's correct what what is it what does it mean to be iranian well, this question can be answered from so many different perspectives, and that's why it's weird because, you know, Iranian people are literally a blend of that whole, like, Indo-European and, and also, like, like it's just a whole weird ethnic group that's been mixed in whatever. So, like, I'm not going to answer this question ethnically. What does it mean <laughs> to be Iranian is is a funny question. To Arya, to after him. To me, yeah. it, it, it's... Uh, I don't have to answer I, it. I I'm not know. expecting you to give that's me a like historical saying, thesis. That's like saying, what does it mean to be Jian? And it's like, I just am. You know, what, like, what, like you. Like, what, what is it like to be Jian? What is it like to be Jian? It, it's just, well, you I just would are. Say, no, I could come up with an answer to that. It's interesting. I wake up. Sometimes I like to run. I enjoy halva. I mean, <laughs> you know, now, what does it mean for you to be an Iranian? Well, the halva is involved for <laughs> sure. Um, the pistachio halva or the ooh. almond halva? halva no, pistachio. Oh, okay. pistachio, yeah. pistachio. But but I'll take it how I can get it. I think it's 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 uh, carrying the culture on your back. That that's real. The short answer, because there's this beautiful. Uh, culture that is in fact so beautiful that in the past when we've had uh, empires come in and take our people over they would still continue our culture even though they weren't uh, of Farsi Persian whatever the word you want to use descent they came from other places and they took our they appropriated our culture because it was so cool see you came up with an answer to that I, I tried my best no, I it, was, it was a passionate answer <laughs> <laughs> You, you played the 2,500 years card, but that's <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's fair game, fair game. Um, it has been a it's it's really uh, I I always appreciate speaking to someone who is raw and clear and honest about where they're at. I I am uh, excited about the raw artistry of this album, and it's here in person in front of me with you <laughs> speaking to me. I want to go out on a song that is um, it's on this new album, but I think you released it uh, a, a few months ago, to, actually to a bit of acclaim in the last year. It's called Vibin'. Mm-hmm. What, what can you tell us about this okay, song? This song is very important, okay, because it comes to in the tail end of the album, and its function is that despite the fact that the cards are stacked heavily against you in this modern age, there is no reason not to find ways to have fun. And if that means being a little ignorant and just pushing things out of the way to have a good time, that is necessary sometimes to like cleanse yourself of the constant like anger and eruption that happens when you're, you know, connected to your phone. And that was something that I I wanted to write in the song too. You know what I mean? Like I wrote uh, all these voices in my phone, broken symphonies. Because they, cause they don't align. All the voices that come out, you are, are really like a broken symphony that's all playing different tunes and different things. And it's like, sometimes you just got to be like, shut up, like mm-hmm. stop. You know what I mean? And and you just keep vibing out. You're just chilling. You're just having a good time. It's definitely got that vibe to it. Where do you want to take this? I mean, what's your what's your uh, teenage boy fantasy about <laughs> this? Is it is it Five Nights at Madison Square Garden? Do yeah. You, I mean, yeah. Straight up, you 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 want to be a big star. I want to. Uh, here's the thing: you want to dominate the world. You want, I mean, you say on that track about winning a Grammy and stuff. Yeah. That, that's you. You want that. Uh, yeah. You don't have to be the modest guy who's you know just uh, critics love. You want to. You want well, big star. Well, here's the thing: I'm I'm not a proponent of stacking your chips to the ceiling necessarily and mm. just monetizing as hard as you can. Okay. But I am a proponent of making timeless art. That's something that's very deeply important to me. Uh, what I what I aspire to be is is very simple. You interview uh, 
Persian diaspora all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So if I ask you, name a Persian star, you know, you, you you probably have a pretty easy time. I might even have an easy mm-hmm. time. But if you ask John or Barry or Chad or Chet to ask, to name a Persian star, mm-hmm. it's going to take them some time. I would say yo. Yo. Oh, they would say yo, right? They yeah. would say yo. Um, and so you want to be on that list. I want to for Chad and Chet and Barry to just go after Hill. You know, uh, it, it is, it's an album that will make a mark. And I really will. And I really, I really appreciate... Uh, uh, the, you coming in here the day before it's it's uh, it's coming out and and so we can be part of it. I uh, again appreciate your candor. I appreciate what you've done art- artistically. I love that you got Airfon involved, and uh, <laughs> it's been really fun talking to you. It's only the beginning. I look forward to doing this with many more records. Hey, of course, man. Thank you for having me. It was Thank honest. you, sir. After Hill, a rapper, artist based in Canada. His debut album comes out tomorrow, January fifteenth. It's called Tehranto. After Hill, join me here in the Rook studio today. Yeah, I don't wear pride in it. Just a drop pennies. I don't go out too much. I learn my lesson. I don't really fuck with love. Been too distracted. And I'm in this race with you Just counting my blessings Now I don't give a fuck about anything All the voices in my phone Broken symphonies And that song is on my demons Come sing with me I'ma keep vibing I'ma keep vibing I'ma keep vibing I'ma keep vibing Little taste of vibing from After Hill, and his debut album comes out tomorrow, January fifteenth. Tehranto, such a pleasure to have him on the show. Uh, the team has reassembled to discuss Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. Uh, I can tell you enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm really impressed. I'm. I, I was not expecting to really love this guy. Such an intelligent young man, and you know, I grew up with uh, Western hip hop my whole life, but Persian rap never really. Maybe because I didn't really understand it, but I think this guy's a game changer for me. You know, uh, English Persian rap. It's amazing. Yeah, he's Shia, it. you enjoyed that. I really enjoy that. I, I, I have a point. I mean, when you told him that this is a blessing for you, that you, you know, you earned money, yes. you lost it. Yeah. And it's really a blessing for yeah. him. It's really I think so, too. I think me. I think he learned some lessons early. I mean, he's yeah. not he's not a, a kid. He's not that young. He's 23. But he's but he's he's young enough yes. that uh, he could lose his way. And and it's great that he kind of had uh, a bump er- already in his life, so that he can uh, try and figure things out now. You know, I mean, uh, who knows? It's a strange time in music and, and in and in marketing and when how things become hits and don't. But I think this, as I said at the end of that interview, and I said at the beginning of the interview, I, I really think this guy is going to uh, make big strides around the world. He is he is talented, he's interesting. The music he makes is is compelling, I think. And uh and he's doing something that nobody's done before. I mean, mm-hmm. he's a Persian guy talking about but he's doing it in English. And uh and, I mean, even Persian rap is new enough, you know, yes. in general. But that but it's been in Farsi. So to see after doing this is uh it's really fun. Yeah, it's something like rock, you know. We need some content mm. in English to you know, he is the rook of rap. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's, hey, he's pretty rook, too. Yeah. Uh, let's face it. Captain Reza, you want to chime he, in? Yeah, I love that he knows the history of rap. I, I, he's, he's done his homework, mm. and he re, he's really committed to his craft. I admire people like that. Because yeah. I'm, like, I'm a filmmaker, and I, I, I dig that, that kind of thing, like learning about the history of film, what was the first film that ever made, stuff like that. So when I see him, I'm not, I'm, I'm not into music necessarily, but when I see somebody so dedicated and devoted to his craft, 
Mm. It, it really, it really puts a smile on my face. And really rapping about things that matter in this world. Like, you know, he's trying to help his own people. Uh, his his analogy with the ice cream, like, you you know, you brought up the fact that he still has, you know, he has the essence of rap music, like the girls and stuff. Yeah. And he said, basically, you have to give the people what they want and expect through rap, but just kind of <laughs> sandwich the meaningful stuff in there. That part's open to, to debate, whether he needs to go that far in that <laughs> in that uh, direction. But I understand what he's saying. Yeah. And, and he's still figuring himself out, too, as he should be, you know, as we all are. Mm. All right, lots to get to on this show still. Salman Tahirpur and Kiani Concept coming up in a little bit. But let's get to our next segment, a special one indeed. Here we go. He is the captain of cuisine, the culinary colonel, the Tabrizi talisman, the Farsi foodmeister, the Turkish tradesman. It's your chef, Hossare, and this is Rok Hospitality. <laughs> This is your chef Hassare. And this is Rok Hass. All right. Hello, Chef Hass. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. How is beautiful San Francisco? It's wonderful. It's a little crispy, uh, sunny, and nice weather. All right. Well, the whole gang is here. We're excited for a, a new edition of Hospitality, our second edition, actually. Uh, what are you going to teach us about today on Hospitality? Well, today I'm excited. Today it's going to be a uh, how to eat the halwa and not feel guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How to eat halwa and not feel guilty about it. And why, why, why did you think of this at this moment? Well, because we just uh, went through the holiday season and uh, <laughs> celebration and people, they have a tendency to eat a lot and especially when it comes to sweet. And um, we human, we like sweet. So we got to talk about the halwa is one of our favorite desserts. So we're going to talk about it. You know, uh, uh, first of all, I love you for talking about halwa because I'm a halwa fanatic. It's close <laughs> to, it's, it's, it's up there with Bowie and Arsenal <laughs> uh, for me, halwa. Uh, 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 but I, uh, you know, I get a little nervous when people talk about it as a dessert because I have, I learned this from my dad and I, maybe I shouldn't out myself, but sometimes I've put halva on toast for breakfast mm. in the morning. Is that, uh, is that a violation of the halva rules? <laughs> No, not really, because I grew up eating the halwa for breakfast. So absolutely, it's part of the breakfast. You oh, okay. Like a waffle, we eat it with a sim simple syrup in the morning. Oh, so that, there you yeah. go. All right, so I'm, I'm keen to learn why halva is, can, can actually, we can eat halva and, and not feel guilty. But tell us a bit about what halva is, first of all, for those who, uh, well, for all of us, I guess, to learn the, the roots of it. Exactly. Your well, halva basically refers to various local convection recipes. Basically, it's made of the 50% sugar and rest of it is going to be a, could be flour, could be semolina, could be um, uh, tahini from sesame, and could be from sunflower seeds or the squash seeds. So it's a combination of the, uh, the carb and the sugar mixed together and make something delicious. Uh, but not healthy, hundred percent. Is there? <laughs> is it? Well, if it's fifty percent sugar, I guess that we've got a long way to go on how you're going to make this healthy for us. But uh, is there an authentic kind of halva? Like, is there a kind of halva that you go, that's halva, as opposed to something that you might find in a local supermarket or something? Well, that's we're going to talk. Pretty much any halva you buy from store, you have to be, be careful about processed food. And that I am, that's one of my, at the end of the show, I'm going to give you my five, six tips how you can make a halwa at home healthier than you buy it from the store. Because stores, food, uh, halwa is like processed food, and they are high on the sugar, and the sugar they use is a base of white sugar, and it's not good for you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, are you guys all halwa fans as well? Or actually, yes, but I, I have a question. I mean, because you, Zian, you once told me that uh, you like halwa. Yes. For for me, I mean, when somebody says halva, it's kind of dark brown, yeah. uh, mm. uh, less solid, kind of liquid, solid thing. Uh, that that's we, not halva to me. Yeah. That, yes, that's interesting. To me, it's the light light brown kind of yeah. with pistachios in it we or something. We call it halva arde. That's interesting. But the actually. thing is, there, yeah, there are different halvas, like maskati, halva, maskati, lari. If, if only we had a chef to tell us what to... <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're talking about right now. <laughs> I love how we're halva. like, let's yeah, talk about... Yeah. Okay, so chef, so so how do you react to what Shia just said and that the kind but of halva you know, like That's one of the halvas. You know, it's basically halva, that if you go 7th century, halva was made with just date and milk. Ooh. There. Mm. And that was the first in the 7th century. Then eventually on the 13th century, 
the word come from the Arabic word, but it's been expanded and popularized by Ottoman Turks. And then the variety came from Central Asia, Middle East, and then True Romania became uh, the Latin word, and then it became expanded. So, and a variety of halawas can be made, like we talk, it can be flour, it can be semolina, it can be tahini, which is in Iran we call arde. And it was on the 13th century later in Iran, they made the, the one Shia talking, uh, um, um, it's uh, with the flour, and uh, they yes. added gold, rose water and uh, uh, saffron. And that became very popular. That's what one of the kind, one of the many kinds of the halwa. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we are uh, standing at attention here. We're actually sitting, but we are sitting at attention, waiting to hear how we can eat halva or have halva and not feel guilty, especially after our <laughs> Christmas or our holiday indulgence and the quarantine. So, uh, go ahead. How, how do we do okay. this? Okay, why makes halwa not, like in the dessert, it's not healthy, it's the sugar. I mean, if you look at the sugar, base of table sugar, you're talking about the white sugar, you have a 50-50 equal of glucose to fructose. And glucose is one of the main combined body that cause you diabetic. And the, another 50% fructose is good for you, but it's high on calorie and uh, carbohydrates. The second one, fructose, you can exercise, get rid of it. But the first one is we have to be careful zero nutritious value in the sugar. Okay. There's no nutritious value, nothing, zero. It's sugar the, is bad, yes. Yeah, that's we know that. Okay. So the whole idea we want to look for it is how we can find something has a more fructose than glucose in combined. Unfortunately, most sugars are on that, but then we're going to talk about the agave syrup, which is the mm-hmm. I am going to recommend at the end. Agave? So we're gonna talk about Ag- agave, agave syrup. Agave syrup, agave syrup, agave syrup, agave syrup, or the molasses. So we're going to talk uh-huh. about the why it, like you think about honey is healthy, but honey has an almost equal combined of sugar on the sugar glucose fructose. Damn it. It's even a natural, but it's a shame uh, problem for your body. Mm-hmm. So again, we can exercise, get rid of the carb, but we cannot get rid of that. Like for example, glucose causes the blood clot. Mm. That's the biggest uh, problem with the sugars. I like always sugar. thought honey was healthy. It yeah, was me a too. Why, now you're, so now we I. can't eat honey. <laughs> what are you doing well, to us? Honey, yeah. <laughs> ruining honey my life. Has more water. Yeah, in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so far we've learned what we can't eat. <laughs> what, how, so how do you make the, or how can we have the halva and, and have it be healthier? Okay, the halva, we make it at home, and that's one. Another one that you want to do is use the sweet factor. You can use it as a na- na- natural, like a fruit, like a grapes, or the at-home road, or the dates. You can just mix it with the water and incorporate mm. it with your halva. A lot of nuts in it. Use in some regular bleach flour. Use semolina. Semolina is good for you. Okay. And um, and also, if you know, in Iran, we add saffron, cinnamon, gingers. These are healthy spices infused to halwa, make a more healthier factor. Since there is no uh, benefits in the sugar, and there are lots of carb in the uh, the flour, so they added like a saffron, cinnamon, ginger, some spices. To give like my favorite one is the cinnamon and ginger uh, halwa in Tabriz they make it was my childhood favorites mm. uh, my mom used to make it so introduce that one again another one uh, part of the, uh, the eating the halwa is exercise a lot have a lot of water but again use a natural product when you're doing a halwa like if you can puree the carrots or beets infuse your halwa carrots so rather than Carrots. Carrots has a sugar level and a like sweetness. And you can, I have a carrot halva too, oh, or the beet know. halva. You've, so, okay. you've, you've lost all of us. <laughs> <laughs> carrot uh, halva. No. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, halva. I mean, the, the, the carrot uh, halva. So, for, 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 first of all, I, I've never made halva, but is it, it is it hard to make halva at home? Uh, not really. It's uh, very easy. Uh, it's a little uh, time, like any food, uh, love to it. You have to, you know, patient and. Um, uh, you, like a, you can use a, like a, a sesame a tahini paste uh, mm. uh, you, or flour is the one toughest one. Uh, but I'm going to give you a trick on the uh, air for you. When they do the flour, they have to toast it to get that rawness of the flour in the pan. And you can make it very messy in the kitchen when you toast on the pan. These days you can use the uh, in the oven and give the first five, ten minutes in a slow temperature, a little caramelized on the flour in the oven rather than doing the pan and then bring it back to the pan, saute pan, you start adding your uh, the butter to it and make a halwa. So All that's right. one technique I recommend 
do not make too much mess in your kitchen. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is, uh, can you write this out or you've got this recipe for a halva somewhere? Well, I have a couple of recipes that I'm after the show. I'm gonna post it like last time I posted Kalajush. Exactly. Uh, and I'm gonna put some halva recipes. We will over. also put that on our Instagram at Rook Media, uh, so for people to see uh, Chef Hoss's uh, suggestions for how to make uh, halva. Listen, if for for those of us who don't have the time or inclination to want to uh, make halva right now, is there somewhere we can get healthier halva? Or is, since you're telling us not to go and get the kind we get at the supermarket. Well, in, uh, I mean, in, in, it's not just a halva. Any dessert has a sugar. So, but again, you have to. Okay, limitation is a factor on everything. Like, if I, I was almost stage of being diabetic uh, six months ago, but I by exercise, by following my like, for example, my doctor told me today you have an, an orange, which is one orange enough for your twenty four hours of your body sugar level. Don't have another pear or apple half the day after so okay. pace yourself same as dessert halva i'm writing like this down no honey no oranges <laughs> no pears <laughs> no no, no i didn't say no oh, okay. once <laughs> once a day like today if i have an orange i don't want to follow up with apple i will have the apple tomorrow because one oh. orange enough sugar you for so it sounds like butter. you don't have halva on your toast anymore in the morning and i do but after that i go for a jog for three miles oh Wow, that's it's a lot of work for Halva. It's not worth it. It may be worth it for Halva. It may be worth I it for guess. Halva. Can I add something to Please, Halva? Please, yes. Halva has a very deep root in uh, uh, Persian classic literature. Mm. Like here, when when somebody wants to say, your lips taste like chocolate, in Persian classical literature, they usually say your lips taste like halva. Is that <laughs> what you tell your girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Did you know that, uh, Chef Hoss? Yes, that's a good one. There are lots of expression. The story I heard from my dad, great aunt, you, uh, you remember old days, we didn't have TV, we used to get the stories. It's about why halva in the ma made in Iran after the people, they die, they give oh, you yeah. halva. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they the think funerals. that the, uh, the flower comes from the earth. So basically, it shows when the press are cooking the white flower from the white days, good nice days, to brownish them, you're aging. Then they add saffron, make a reddish color because that's the glory days. Eventually become black, that means you wow. die. And you're going to back to the diet, and they give you sweetness. Like, okay, you had a sweet life. This person had a sweet life. Cherish his life and have a little halal after that. That's beautiful. Wow. There are lots that. of expression, and one is not as good as Shaya told me, told us. But the good, this is like a base of the Turkish people. After eat the uh, fish, they eat halva. Basically, they want to tell the fish that you are dead. Basically, <laughs> after somebody <laughs> died, they eat halva. So basically, <laughs> this is very funny. Yeah. Uh, after the fish be, in Iran, we are always when you have a fish, you have to have something sweet. What, what what's body. the what's the actual saying in Farsi? What, what do you say? Halva ro bad as mahi be khuch be fahm chum morde. It's Great. very funny, but it makes sense. So anyway, uh, uh, Chef Haas, you've done it again. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you for teaching us. We've learned about last week it was cash, or a couple of weeks ago today it's halva. Uh, we always look forward to every episode of Hospitality. Follow Chef Haas on Instagram. We'll link to him from ours, Rook Media. Thank you, brother. It's always a pleasure being in your company, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, our next feature guest is contributing some really interesting art, design, and historical vibrance to the diaspora with his brand. He was born in Tehran on January 16th, 1979. That is the exact day that Mohammad Reza Shah and Shah Bonu Farah left Iran for good. And that has also been strangely germane to Salman Tahirpur's life journey. From an early age, Salman felt passionate about ancient Persian history and cultural fashion. Salman realized that some objects are so important that they must be preserved, especially when it comes to national heritage and cultural pride. So to honor his love of Iran and its golden age, Salman founded Kiani Concept in 2014. This is where he creates high quality jewelry and accessories, all inspired by symbols of our ancient history, our rich and colorful 
powerful heritage and of the late Shah as well as the Shah Monu. Right now, Salman Taherpur joins me from Gutenberg, Sweden. Hello, sir. Hello. I want to start by thank you for inviting me to the interview, and it's an honor for me to be able to share my story with your listeners. Thank you for that. And and I should say, uh, uh, the honor is ours because from what I understand, I don't know if I have this right, but this is the first, I know you've conducted many, many interviews over the years. I've watched them, but uh, this is the first interview you've ever done in English. Yes, it is. And uh, it's going to be excited. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> English, you know, I speak Farsi, Swedish, uh, Norwegian, and a little bit Spanish. And uh this this is gonna be like I said. This is gonna be excited because, uh, like I said, is uh, is my. I am not so good at English, but I will try my best. Your English is fantastic, and I'm. <laughs> uh, you should have done a lot more interviews in English, but we're we're thrilled to be the first. Uh, listen, someone, you, you the, the story goes. You loved fashion as a kid, but didn't know growing up in Iran as a little kid that this could actually be a career. Tell me about loving fashion, but not seeing it as some sort of career opportunity when you were little boy uh, the thing is 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 still not the career for me i'm a uh, i'm working at the healthcare uh, for a uh, project it manager in different hospitals in sweden and this is something that i'm educated to and have worked with it for past 20 years everything starts with the hobby and the interest i have for fashion and uh, jewelry and special art history so uh, it start as a hobby, but today uh, is a almost uh, a, a medium sized company, and we sell to the all of the world uh, beside Iran because of the sanctions and the problem we have. But uh, this is like a, a, a little baby for me that I grow in every day to be better and better and better. Well, let me put it this way. Could you have imagined when you were a little boy or when you became a software engineer in healthcare in Sweden before 2014 that you would become known around the world as a high-end designer uh, with with a company that has fans spanning the globe? No, I never thought of that. Thought of that. Uh, it's good. Be, it's like it was a dream. It was always that's a dream, but uh, it was far away from all my things that I want to do in my life. But Suddenly, I think about it that you come into the point that the many things that you are always have the uh, the interest for, you're gonna make it to happen. That's that's that was my dream, and the Kiani concept started for six years, six seven years ago, and like I said, it was a hobby. But suddenly, when I I get uh, very good comments from my friends, family, and so on, and uh, I start to have more time for it and make more researchers and so on, and uh, yeah, the, the dream came true. Where uh, did what what was the precipitant, Salman? When you were, um, where did the? I mean, you say it was a hobby, uh, design and fashion, but where did this idea of luxury products? or um, accessories and jewelry that have a piece of Iranian history attached to them? Where did that come from? I can go back and tell you the whole story. It was like when I was six, seven years old, I played in my grandmother's big yard, and the yard had an old uh, basement with lots of old wine and old torshi, you mean, the old, like the things they have in the basement. And I went in there and I saw a box, and inside the box I found lots of newspaper from uh, Pahlavi era that my mother had saved. Uh, I was completely fashioned by all the pictures of royalty, especially our Queen Shah Banu Farah Pahlavi. Yes. A new world of color and glitter opened for me. You know, the, in the time when everything was gray, it was the war between Iran and Iraq. And I think that was the point of the spark of my interest for fashion and design. And uh, after that, we moved to Sweden in uh, 1990, and I was always collecting antiques like stamps, banknotes, medals, ma and many other things. And every time when I received any gift from Iran, I didn't, I didn't like it because 
all the bad work they had done would uh, they don't have any sense for details hmm. uh, until I get some military uniform gold plated buttons with lion sun on it and they look so good and had really nice details hmm. uh, I realized that this could not have been done in Iran <laughs> is too good to be true I look at the back and I saw the brand of it is was the brand Sporong and under that he said made in Sweden I was really shocked you know uh, after so many years I live in Sweden and they were made here in Sweden so I started researching about this for long and I realized that this company is over 100 years old and they are best in the world of making buttons uh, medals and many Olympics medals and so on and uh, I tried to contact them and get more info about the things they did make for Iran and uh, you know it's have been more than 40 years ago and was not an easy job to find someone that has any information and uh, finally I was able to find a person who was uh, retired and his job in the 70s was to get the order from Iran and uh, I had a coffee with him and he told me many many stories and he said when he received orders from Imperial Iranian Army we were so happy uh, because they never ask for price and the most important thing was the, the quality and the, the details so we did the uh, uniforms medals and uh, many uh, accessory things for for the army uh, for Iran so uh, after that I think like I always had this plan to uh, create a brand to do the design very good in details and make them uh, so we can be proud of it. So uh, like I say, it, it starts as a hobby and uh, I choose the word uh, Kiani which means royalty and concept to, to be able to Yes. expand the product not just the jewelry let me pick up on a few things you've said there first of all i was i was going to ask you you sort of answered the question but i was going to ask you i mean you weren't even alive when the pahlavi dynasty was still in power in iran yes. um, and, and so i was curious where your clear and profound devotion comes from so it comes from the boxes in your grandmother's basement um, yes. and, and which would have been uh, i mean you, you know this is now in the 80s in in sort of the heart harshest time of the uh, the current regime or the Islamic regime uh, you find these things and you uh, it sounds like you had the reaction to um, the former Shah and Shah Banu the way a kid does to a sports star or a rock star um, what was it that so inspired you seeing these pictures you know the inspiring thing was like when you grow up in the uh, 80s uh, everything was darkening around you know even the the books you have in school, everything was so uh, depressing, and uh, you didn't see any colors. You didn't see any nice, uh, clean pictures of people. And suddenly, when you open the ma magazine and see so much colors, you see people with uh, nice clothes and so on. And and it, and it was for me for a kid like six seven years old is is like a dream come true it's like a you see it's like i was uh, able to see colors before that i was blind mm -hmm. you know that was the thing uh, that was the spark like okay this is not the iran i have grown up with iran has another history that is more than more than this i uh, see today at the school, at the society, and so on. The, the other part that's that's curious or interesting about this is, and it intersects with what the whole focus of this program is, is that you leave Iran at ten. Uh, you know, you know, you've you're four, you've been living for four decades. So you know, uh, three quarters of your life has been outside of Iran and has been in Sweden, and yet you launch this company uh, not with the iconography of the King of Sweden. But um, but w with Iran, I guess, you know, you can take the boy out of Iran, but you can't take the Iran out of the boy. Oh, absolutely. It's like that. I don't have any relationship with the king of uh, Sweden, but the king of Iran, the Pahlavi era, you know, I love history. I, I read books and 
you know, there is so many things that we uh, see today, documentary, and so many things that even our parents didn't know that. Uh, many lies about the family, Pahlavi family, many things that they told us that today we finally know the real truth. The last book of the Shah was answer to the history. And, the, the, you know, the history is telling us everything. If you don't know your history, you can't, you can't go to the future. You don't need to be fast in the history because you're never going forward. That's uh -huh. another thing. But before you're going forward, you must you know, you know your history. If you have pain in your stomach and when you go to the uh, doctor, the first question that doctor will ask is, what have you eaten? You know, what have you eating? Is your history. If you yes. don't know what you have yes, eating, yes. so the, the doctor can't do anything about it. That's right. So you must know that. You know, that's that's the thing. That this is the history. And the answer is usually too much game. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> or but, 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 you know, on this question of his, history, let me, let me just gently push back because uh, you talk about wanting to celebrate the design and imagery of Iranian history, but I was going through all of your, your materials and actually one of our team members is a, is a real fan of your, mm -hmm. your products, but uh, we mostly find crowns, Pahlavi passport cases, scarves and jewelry with the images of the Shah and Shah Panu in your works. I mean, I suppose some might say, it's not a diverse or comprehensive look at our Iranian history. It's sort of Pahlavi era. How do you respond to that? Let me say it like this. You know, if you look at Iranian history, it has always been black and white after the invasion of Islam. Until the Reza Shah, the great come to the power. You know, during the 51 years of Pahlavi dynasty rule, everything gets more color. Our country is advancing day by day. We learn much about our history and value more our art in all parts of our country. Every details, every design, every story behind it is good made. And uh, I always try to follow these rules as well. Mm. You know, every 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 famous building in Iran, even even Taht Jamshid, Persepolis, it was under the ground before Reza Shah. Reza Shah took it out from him. Uh, you know, I can name it, Saadi, Hafez, Khayyam, all of this was building under the Pahlavi era. But so, you, you know some people will see that as political, what you're saying. Is your work meant to be political? If I, I would lie to you if I say no, because I'm a political person. Because I, I will always say, like, uh, if you, you know, many people, like, uh, they, when I designed the crown, and uh, they connected directly to the Pahlavi crown. But... If you know your history, you know that even the crown that Pahlavi has, this is not nothing to do with the Pahlavi. It's a copy of the Sasanian period in mm -hmm. Iran. When the Reza Shah, Reza Shah came to uh, power in Iran, and he said the Gajar dynasty has uh, ruined Iran in every way. They have sold the pa uh, part of uh, even uh, part of the Iran to the Russian to the, the uh, uh, Englishman and so on. So uh, now we must concentrate on everything that we have in history and bring back our history, bring back the golden age of Iran. You know, I used to say that if you erase 51 years of Pahlavi era from our history, so the Islamist Republic is the modern version of Gajar era. And we know today that Gajar era did destroy a country and Islamic Republic doing its today as well. So that's why I concentrate more about this era of Iran. And uh, I try to do my, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be like uh, other designers that do everything. You know, they do Taht Shamshi, they do, uh, uh, you know, the, the font, Persian right, font with right. Eshka, all that. Right. And they do everything that... Uh, the people wants or the majority wants. This is not me. You know, I need, and my design is like, if you see it from 100 meters, you know that this is the Kiani concept. You know, uh, this is my signature. I won't, uh, it's, it's neither the place nor the point of this to, to, to get into a historical debate. I, I, it's I, partly fair to say that it, the, your your work is, is, is about quite beautiful luxury items and concepts and a part celebration and homage to the former Shah and Shah, Shah Ponu. Would that be fair? 
Yes. Yes. Hey, and and you, you've done works with the former Queen Fat Adiba. Uh, tell me about your recent Empress of Art exhibition. What was the idea behind that? Uh, the thing is, uh, Empress uh, Farah Pahlavi gave uh, Iran not only her lifetime, but the bring also a wave of beautiful and unique fashion sense in the country. From her Yves Saint Laurent wedding dresses to her Chanel and Dior dresses, Her Majesty bring modernity to Iran, but also did take care of the traditional Iranian culture. Shahbanu did much, so much for the culture of uh, culture and art for our beloved country, you know. From Art Museum, one of the world's greatest art collection, to Shiraz Art Festival with the world, all the greatest artists in the world was involved in the, the, that festival. So for me, she's more than a queen. She's a art icon. And uh, the thing is, she always has supported me. I, uh, every time I design something that has involved with her, I send it to her and I talk with her and uh, she tell me things that maybe I never thought about before. And uh, she she's like a second mother for me. You know, wow. I love her. From all of my heart. And back, back to back to the little boy growing up and and looking at those uh, pictures in your grandma's uh, basement. I guess it, somewhere in you there must be a lot of excitement to know that she's like a second mother. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, there is people that doesn't like Pahlaviera or they didn't doesn't like the show, but you can't find many people that doesn't like Shahkono. Mm-hmm. You know, her, she's uh, she's a uh, icon like i said yes. yes yeah yeah i, I want to ask you about one of your uh, um other pieces prominent pieces you you sell a very ostentatious version of the former iran flag you've talked about how americans put the u.s flag on so much of their fashion and design uh, tell mm-hmm. me about the importance of shira khorshid and why you put it in your designs first of all it's not our former flag it's our royal flag and uh, the history of the lion sun is more than five thousand years old there is many people that love the Iranian flag, the, the lion and sun, but they doesn't care that the, the look and the design about the lion. Some of the lion you have seen is like uh, very ugly, and <laughs> some are, yeah, very. Uh, it's it's a lion. It should it, it should have the, uh, the the charisma, the proud. You understand? It's like you should uh, have the good design on it and so on. And that was always. Uh, uh, bothered me so much. So I designed this flag with the silk and the uh, gold traded uh, uh, lines inside it. And uh, the flag is like, for me, is it, is uh, everything, it's one of the very important things mm-hmm. about our history, mm-hmm. about everything, about our land or our presentation. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, American flag, you see it in every single thing. You can see it on shirts, you can see it on panties, you can see it on everything. Brand it's, logos, brand logos, they use the flag. It's a like yeah. brand. So why should could we not have it for our flag? Uh, you know, it's, it's, my, it's my dream to uh, have it on many things, you know. Uh, I have an idea to design, uh, you know, sm- small teddy bears like uh, with the, the uh, line and sun on it or for a kid uh, when they grow up, they express themselves with the with the flag. Right. But, but you, you know, you, you've said that this is the real flag. I mean, I find the flag, I have to say, I find the flag issue very confusing, <laughs> like how to do this. Because uh, for, for example, at World Cup time, we want to celebrate by waving an Iranian flag, but we don't we don't mean it to be an endorsement of the current regime in Iran. And and yet, say when you're you want to use an icon on your Instagram profile to, to show where you're from, you don't have the option of anything but using the current flag of Iran. I so that. I what is your ta- what is your take on that? How do we navigate that? I, I don't I don't use it because this is not the Iranian flag. This is the Islamic Republic flag. We have the people that speak Arabic as well, but the national language Iran is Farsi. But in the our flag, it's in Arabic. And this flag is representing all the war, all the terrorists, all the bad happening things in Iran. You know, the other, other, other side, when you have the lion and sun, 
is represent the, the, our great history, our great people, our, is not just the Pahlavi era, our, our over 5,000 years history. That's the thing. You know, listening to you right now, I'm thinking you're, you're quite outspoken on this. Obviously, your jewelry and products, I'm assuming, can't be sold in Iran. Have you yeah. have you heard from the government? Do they do they see you as some kind of a, from the regime? I mean, do they see you as a threat? Do they try and shut you down? They have they have trusted me several times. They send me emails and sometimes that uh, they and threat me, but I never take them as serious. But one time, they hacked my website, so I did have problem to bring back my website. It took me a lot, like two or three weeks before I could it, to take it back. So they. Hack it, and uh, the company that have my platform, they told me that they have been hacked from a server from Iran. You're not afraid. I think like there is people inside the Iran mm. that do ten times, hundred times more than what I do, and they are not afraid. They do all this demonstration, they do all these uh, things against the regime, and. I sitting here in Sweden, should I be afraid for something that they easily, they just send me some emails and they said, okay, I'm afraid I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, no, none. I'm curious about your audience for, uh, for for your products and for your accessories and for your jewelry, but but mostly I'm curious, do you hear from people in Iran uh, who would want to be able to somehow get this, the, your, 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 your Kiani concept uh, accessories? I get, I, I get more than maybe 50, between 50 to 100 every day message from Iran that they want to buy the same. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, I have tried to send several times to Iran, but it's never getting uh, to the customer. I don't know, maybe they, because everything you send to Iran, it, the, the shipping company they will they open it before they right, deliver. Right, it. right, right. Uh, so I don't know. They threw it away. They take it for itself, I think. And uh, so my vision. And I, my uh, dream is one day that I open my gallery in the heart of Tehran. This, ah. is, this, is, this is my vision. When I had my first meeting with uh, Shah Panu, uh, she told me that, uh, is it going to be real jewelry, like real gold or real silver or real stones and so on? So on? I told her, no, for me, it's like, I want to have uh, this one, like uh, mostly plated or maybe uh, Swarovski crystals instead for real crystal because I want to have the, the prices for uh, uh, regular people to use it. Right, you know, right. that's 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 the thing. You know, if well, you, I have, you have a range, right? Because you have some really high end stuff, and then you have really accessible stuff. Mm, pre, uh, you know, my I think uh, the most expensive things I have is uh, one hundred eighty dollars. Is like the most expensive things I have in in the, my website. So. Uh, if I'm, there is many people that want it in gold and so on. If, you know, I have that that uh, crown pin that is really popular yes. for thirty dollar. And uh, if I'm gonna make it with gold, it's gonna cost the thousand dollar. You know. Well, I was for gonna. Uh, um, uh, first of all, I'm so grateful to get to the, uh, the the time you've given us. And by the way, your English, I think you've proven is excellent, and <laughs> you can do uh, a thousand English interviews after this now because it's <laughs> well, it's it's, it's flawless. But um, <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, as a final question, to ask you where you would like to take Kiani concept. But you may be a victim of your own success. I mean, if this keeps growing, I'm not sure. How how you do a, a nine to five job and keep <laughs> and have this company uh, and its popularity continuing to grow? Do you have a plan to um, uh, make this your full time job or uh, have a have a have a uh, start a company with a bigger staff or how are you going to do it? Right now, I concentrate to make uh, new designs and uh, uh, try to uh, think how I can do the marketing and uh, plan for exhibitions and so on. Uh, so today we are for a person that uh, work with this uh, Kiani concept now and uh, I had this vision to open my first gallery in Toronto uh, then uh, the whole thing with the COVID and so on so the maybe the first one is going to be in Toronto and because I, I did have uh, the, 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 ex, the exhibition both in Los Angeles and London with many Iranians but in Toronto, it was different. Like uh, Iranian in Toronto was more, uh, more uh, 
more Iranian, you know, is what's more, they want to keep the culture more than Los Angeles and London. Because in London, you know, in Los Angeles, you see people that have lived there for 40 years. Exactly. It's a newer, years. it's a newer community here. Yeah. And, and a and, very, very rapidly growing one, a very big one too, as you know. Absolutely. But in Toronto, you know, it was like, uh, when I saw so many Iranian that keep the culture, keep the our traditional, keep the our uh, our, our uh, great events and so on, and I was thinking like uh, Toronto maybe is uh, is gonna be the first place that uh, I will uh, open my store. Uh, not in Iranian squares, but <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know Toronto, who are listening around the world, uh, your your references are excellent. You 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 clearly have spent some time here. Uh, you not so not next to Super Khorak, but maybe no, no, close no, no, to not, Cafe no, BB. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing the thing is many 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 stores around the world, Iranian stores. They contact me and they want to sell my products in their stores. And I asked them, like, uh, okay, what kind of stores you have? They said we have, uh, you know, the stores like Super Horak and so on, and we sell everything, and uh, we have many Iranian uh, customers, and they will buy all the things and so on. And I asked him, are you going to put my crown, cufflinks, gold-plated with the uh, turquoise stone uh, beside to Lavoshak or Yekoyek, you know? Yeah, the thing is, <laughs> and they just uh, then and they and they just ask me, "What's your problem? Are you not gonna sell the things, or are you doing this just for show off?" And I tell them that selling has never been my first priority. Uh. You know, representing thing is most important. It's like if you're going to sell something, how you wrap it up, how you sell it, how you represent yes, it. Yes, yes. That's the important thing. Otherwise, I can do mass production and have it in Super Korak as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm going to sell so much as well. But this is this is not my thinking. That's, and that's not. The, <laughs> what about a really good panita tabriz? Would you put the products? <laughs> would you put the products next to a panita tabriz? <laughs> Um, yeah. Salman, I, I, it, it, it's been a pleasure. I thank you for your time. I thank you for uh, doing it in English, and I, uh, I'm sure we'll speak again. Merci. I take it in force in the last of it. I take it in force in the last of it. به امید این که من یک روزی هم گالری ما تو تورنتو داشته باشم و هم تو تهران که شما عزیزان را از نزدیک ببینم به امید Thank you so much for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is Saman Tahirpur, the founder of Kiani Concept. Saman joined us from Gutenberg, Sweden today. That is full time for Rook for today. Remember, you can subscribe at our website, rookmedia.com. You can find our patrons page there as well to support and all of our episodes and links to our platforms, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Producer Susan, Thoughtful Nagin, Ponta the Artist, the fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza Groovy Shaya, and Aray Mehdad. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Mizunbashi.